Okay. All right. I might as well get started just to stay on schedule. So uh, hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, so while we wait for folks to continue to log on, as I mentioned, a lot of them will log on between now and 610 or so. Please feel free to write in the chat your name, uh, where you're joining us from, and what organization you're with, if you like. That's fine. You can also add that information to our Clackamas Conferencing Networking Google Sheet that we've created. Uh, so uh, this is our 12th session of the journey down the Clackamas, and it's been a great success so far, and I've been really learning a lot personally myself, and it's been a lot of fun. So I'm Dave Budney, a board member of the Clackamas River Basin Council, and we live out here in Estacada. To my left is my wife, Mary Ann, and to my right is my sister, Kathy, who is and visiting us from Connecticut. So you know, we've got this interstate uh, uh, session tonight. And then joining me tonight are uh, Gail Shalom, who's the CRBC incoming board chair, and will assist me. Oh, she is the board chair, for goodness sakes. And will assist me in the technical aspects of all this. So before we get into our program, I'll cover a few items. Uh, the Clackamas River Basin Council is celebrating its 25th anniversary, and since its founding in 1996, the CRBC has worked as a non-governmental group of stakeholders to protect and improve the Clackamas River Basin and its tributaries. Their mission is to foster partnerships for clean water and to improve fish and wildlife habitat and the quality of life for all those who live, work, and recreate in the Clackamas River watershed. So on behalf of the Council, I'd like to thank our two gold sponsors, there's the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative and the Clackamas Water Environment Services. And Gail's just gonna play a brief one minute video that describes some of what the Recycling Cooperative does because it's, it's important what they do here in Portland. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Some reason it's not playing completely uh, correct. There's uh, missing an audio, but you get the gist. So while this, since there's no uh, audio here, I'll just add a little bit of information. Uh, there's both, as you see here, the green bags as well as uh, blue tip blue bags. And uh, the blue bags, if you have a favorite nonprofit, in our case, it's Clackamas River Basin Council. If you're interested, you can uh, contact uh, Cheryl McGinnis here, our executive director, and uh, get blue bags because all the, all the bottles and cans and whatnot that you turn in, uh, some of those proceeds can help benefit our organization. Okay, good. So I'd also like to thank our, uh, oh, it's still going. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I was able to hear it. So I don't know what I should have done for everybody else to hear it too. Okay. That's okay. We've got the gist. It's a great organization. So we also thank our brown sponsors, the Clackamas River Water Providers and the Geological Society of the Oregon Country as well as Metro, who have been uh, donating to our, our uh, webinar series as well. And also thanks to the many individuals who have donated to support this conference, and we continue to seek additional donations, which are tax deductible. The Clackamas River Basin has been occupied by Native peoples for millennia. It's originally the territory of the Clackamas, Chinook, Malala, Kalapuya, and other peoples, and is currently recognized as lands of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and belongs to other Native peoples who may not be federally recognized. We thank those who came before us for their stewardship in these lands and waters and those who continue to steward them now and in the future. So we're gathered tonight for this journey down the Clackamas to learn in-depth information about the basin and its connections to Oregon as a whole, to connect with each other so that we can support our mutual efforts and to protect and improve the Clackamas River and its tributaries and to have some educational fun. So the CRBC is partnering with the Environmental Learning Center at Clackamas Community College as part of this conference. And workshop attendees uh, will receive a signed certificate of completion for each session. If you'd like a certificate of completion, add your name 
or your contact information to our journey down the Clackamas Conferencing Networking Google Sheet. And indicate you like a certificate in the G column and we'll forward your contact information to Clackamas Community College. As usual, I'd like to share a few ground rules before I introduce our special guests for tonight. So please keep your microphones on mute unless invited to participate. And you can keep your cameras off if you like, that will help us to save bandwidth for our presenter and generally reduces our carbon footprint of our meeting. So we'll have one presenter this evening with a brief question and answer period after that presentation. So please type your questions in the chat and we'll select those questions from there. And feel free to send direct chats to your friends you're seeing in the participants list if you like. Now uh, we'll start our presentation for this evening. And so please remember to type your questions in the chat and keep yourself muted and your video off if you can. And we'll answer questions at the end of the presentation. So uh, the amount of material presented this webinar will extend to about uh, 710 or so with questions afterwards. So our presenter tonight is Ms. Claudine Reynolds and she's a wildlife biologist and a director of the wildlife and fisheries program at Port Blakely. She's responsible for overseeing all aspects of wildlife and fisheries resources on Port Blakely's forest lands and providing guidance to the organization on environmental policy, research and, and resource protection issues, as well as overseeing the implementation of their federal and state conservation plans. One of her current projects is to oversee the development of the company's newest federal agreement, a habitat conservation plan for their Oregon forest lands. So without, with that, let's welcome Claudine as she presents about the wildlife in our forests. Take it, Claudine. Thank you, David. And thank you to the Clackamas River Basin Council for inviting me to present today. You should be seeing my presentation. Looks good. Yep, we can see it. Wonderful. Okay. So I had a lot of fun making this presentation because this is a topic that I have a ton of passion for. I've worked as a biologist in forestry in Oregon, Washington for nearly 20 years. And as David said, I'm currently the director of wildlife. So I work at Port Blakely. I'll tell you just a little bit about them before I dive into the presentation. Port Blakely owns and manages working forests in Oregon and Washington, including about 30,000 acres in Clackamas County. Port Blakely is a fifth generation family owned company that's been around for more than 150 years. And they take a generational approach to forestry, whereas the decisions today are made with the needs of the future generations of the family. So to that end, in 2020, the company entered into a 50-year agreement with the Oregon Department of Forestry called the Stewardship Agreement. And under that agreement, uh, the company committed to provide fish and wildlife habitat pre protections that were far beyond forest practice rules, and in return received regulatory certainty should the forest practice rules change in the future. And this gives us much more stability as a family owned business and allows us to design a habitat management plan focused on the things that we care more about, specifically biodiversity and high functioning habitats. So the idea is that our management design didn't have to be politicized, that we could do what we thought was the right thing to do. Uh, we are currently working on the parallel habitat conservation plan for those same forest lands. And that's the project that David mentioned. So these are what I'm going to talk about. This is a very packed agenda because I wanted to give you a little bit of everything. So definitely ask your questions. We'll dive in deeper on, on areas that you're most interested in. But um, instead of going really deeply on one thing with forest and wildlife, I'm giving you a little bit of a lot of different aspects of it. Starting out with Oregon's forest, which I'm sure you've already gotten a little bit about it, but this is just um, one slide to summarize that Oregon comprises 63 million acres of which 30 million acres is classified as forest land. That's about 47%. 8% has been converted to other land uses. That's the cities, towns, highways, and farms. But Oregon is home to more than 65 species of native trees. About half of them are conifers and half are broadleaf. The state's forests can be broken down into main, seven main types seen on the map. They grow in distinct zones defined by geography and climate. 
there is an enormous diversity of plants and animals that thrive within these forests. You've probably seen this beautiful map before. That's our Clackamas River Basin. It is firmly in the Douglas fir tree zone. Douglas fir forests are common throughout the species range due to their ability to regenerate after major disturbances. Map, the light green color represents the forested area in the watershed. You can see that it is the majority of the is forest. It encompasses all headwaters, all the headwater streams of the Clackamas River Basin are interested. I just got a note that my internet is unstable. Are we still connected? Yes, yeah, you're fine. Okay, okay. So um, next I'm going to talk about how energy and nutrients cycle through the forests. This is a very simplified illustration, but what you can see here is that the organisms involved in the system are in interdependent on one another for survival. In this forest ecosystem, plants use energy from the sun to produce new growth. And as part of photosynthesis, carbon is absorbed from the atmosphere and stored in the plant cells. Plant roots drop water and nutrients from the soil. And when plants or animals die, decomposers break them down, returning those nutrients back to the soil. Animals, of course, eat plants and other animals. In our forests, decomposition takes a long time, contributing to the rich and fertile soil that we see. Each plant and animal species has a very important role in the ecosystem, and they function together to keep the ecosystem healthy. And that is really the theme of today's presentation, is that all of the organisms within our forest ecosystem are important to keep the ecosystem healthy. So why do forest animals live where they do? A species habitat is an area that has the combination of resources and environmental conditions it needs to promote that species to live there and allows it to survive and reproduce. How much habitat is enough and what kind is right varies greatly among the wildlife species and across the seasons of the year. While many species can use a variety of forest habitats and have general enough needs that can be met in multiple ways, some species depend on very specific specific habitat types and features. We'll go through some examples of both later in the presentation. So what does create the diversity of habitats that we see in our forests? The history of our region is rich with disturbance. I don't think I need to tell this group that. You have all lived it in this last year. This last year has seen more disturbance than normally we would see in a lifetime. But disturbances happen, they can be natural or man-made, and disturbances that alter forest conditions can be large or small. Most of the species are adaptable and resilient. The wildlife community has involved in this environment. For the most part, they are adaptable and resilient, although the rapid speed of our changing climate is putting everything to the test. And there are some species that are not as adaptable and resilient as others. Here are some examples of what I mean by disturbance, fire, ice, wind, floods, and volcanoes. Sometimes when I look at this slide, I'm like, gosh, that all looks like catastrophe, but it is and it isn't. And last year we did have catastrophic fire and we did not St. Helens erupting and you can see Mount Hood in the back there. Catastrophic on a local scale, mild, further you get away from the mountain, um, the Clackamas River flooding we experienced in 2014, that's a photo of it down on the right. Um, so uh, disturbance has been near to us a lot in the last year. It is and always has been a process in this region, even a, a geologic time frames. it's how this region was shaped. We've seen a lot of it, more of it in recent time than we have in, in the decades that preceded it. Although there may be short-term devastation, there are long-term benefits in the environment. Animals have evolved with their habitats, which make them resilient to a certain level of change. This region of the world is even more geologically dynamic than other regions of the world, which has had an impact on our wildlife species in terms of their adaptability and their resiliency. Disturbance contributes to diversity and resilience on the landscape, and it creates new habitat opportunities by shifting sun and nutrients, soil and sediment and wood all around the landscape. 
After the 2020 wildfires that we experienced last year, we saw immediate responses by many wildlife species. The variable fire intensity, <coughs> essentially what that means is that the fire burned patchy. So if you look at it on a map, you see the footprint of the fire and it looks like one big blob. But when you get out on the landscape, you see that the fire burned more severely in some areas than others. And what that created was a refugia and a place for wildlife to be able to hide and take cover in some patches that did not burn as severely as other patches across that burn. So immediately following the fire, what we saw was a re-emergence of some wildlife that were already out there. We didn't know what we were going to find. It was the first time me and my colleagues had experienced a fire like this. And we were devastated, but then we were absolutely amazed at the resiliency of nature. It was actually incredibly beautiful. Within weeks, we saw the emergence of native forbs and shrubs and the regrowth and renewal that be began. There is a ton of research that's now associated with that fire to actually learn as much as we can about the response that occurs in the natural environment post an, an event like that. So you can imagine the types of activities that cause man-made disturbances as well. This is a photo of a managed forest. A managed forest is one that is grown to produce timber and forest products. So it, I'm talking about managed forest because it acts similarly to a natural disturbance and that it starts the forest life cycle over. So this schematic shows the forex succession and the relationship that different wildlife have with the different stages of forest succession. So disturbance on the landscape resets the forest succession. Forest succession is the pattern of change that takes place over time. When trees are removed, either by natural or man-made causes, the forest regenerates in a predictable order. First comes the grasses and forbs, then shrubs and young trees. In later years, the trees go grow taller than the forbs and shrubs, shifting understory vegetation communities from sun dependent to shade dependent. The wildlife that live in the forest respond to the shifts in this habitat and they alter their locations over time to access the habitats they prefer. This is part of their evolution. Forests that are managed for timber are always replanted within two years after they are harvested. This shortens the early end of the succession spectrum. The process of change to the types, ages, sizes, and arra arrangements of vegetation is relatively continuous throughout this forest succession until another disturbance takes place and returns the site to an early succession stage. Oftentimes we'll see multiple successions within a given forest. Just that means that there's patches, of patches within the forest that are at different levels of this succession. Just as the vegetation at a given site passes through various stages, so does a wildlife community that lives there. The set of species that are occupying and using a given site depend in a very large part on the type and the condition of the vegetation that is there. That's what has attracts them to be there in the first place. Many species will use a variety of habitat types to complete the functions of their daily lives. And more broadly, we know that many species may brought migrate and expand their, ter their territories over very vast areas. Habitat is a shifting mosaic through time as forests and other landscapes move through natural and human altered successional pathways. What is interesting about this diagram is it's showing the number of species that are utilizing these different habitats for different life cycle needs, the breeding and, and feeding, and it will shift throughout these different stages throughout their life cycle. Now we're going to look more closely at the habitat provided by the early, middle, and later successional forests. Young open forests, also called early cereal forests, are the first stage in the forest succession. This is the habitat condition that emerges first after a disturbance has occurred. These forests are very diverse and a lot of wildlife live in them or next to them. They're characterized by having an open canopy. That is, there are a few overstory trees. Residual live and dead standing trees usually are some component of this. 
unless something has taken those trees down as well, such as a windstorm. These young open forests are dominated by emergent vegetation that loves sun. These species often love disturbance and they're quick to colonize. They're adapted for a fast response. The forest floor will have a, a layer of fine and coarse woody material of different tree species that are, that are remnants of the forest that used to be there. These forests are composed of a very wide variety of plants and wildlife. I wanna call out a few of the specific habitat features. These forests provide an abundance of food resources for all kinds of wildlife. Many species of forest habitat types for different parts of their life cycle, like I've mentioned. Some species will live their whole lives in one type of habitat or another, while many will nest, den, and seek cover in adjacent forests but forage in these open areas. These habitats are highly productive and important for many species and play a significant role in the landscape. There in the middle is a snag, and a snag is a standing dead tree. Dead wood is important in forest ecosystem and plays a role in mitigating stress for many forest associated wildlife. More than 100 species of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians need snags for nesting. Nearly 45 species alone forage for food in, in snags. Hollow snags and large knots are used for many species of mammals, such as squirrels, porcupine, and raccoon. Species utilize after they've fallen down, including mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. Structures can act as refuge in many different forms, including shelter, a place for prey, and a place for stable temperature and moisture conditions. A wide variety of wildlife live in these forests. I've only identified a few on this slide. Forests are considered to be in the young, open habitat condition until the trees grow tall enough to shade the understory vegetation. The transition from young to middle-aged forest takes many years but eventually results in a shift in the vegetation and wildlife communities. The habitat shifts themselves do not cause major disturbance to the majority of wildlife because most of them utilize many types of forest habitat to fulfill their life cycle requirements. Are we all still connected here? Yes, it sounds good. Okay, great, thank you. Once the trees grow and create a more shaded understory, they're moving into the middle-aged forest condition. This stage can start younger or occur older. It depends on including the variety of trees that are growing, their density, and how fast they grow. A wide spectrum of characteristics can be used to describe middle-aged forests, but they can be characterized generally by live and dead trees, Usually they're mostly alive at this stage. The understory is for the most part shade tolerant, but there are likely a few patches where sunlight comes through. There's usually a layer of fine and coarse woody debris that covers the forest floor. This is a video showing a landscape of middle-aged forests. This is a managed forest landscape. Let's see here. This drone footage was taken in the hills above Colton. You can see the prevalence of conifer dominated forest. There are some patches of hardwoods on the right. They're the lighter green color. There are different ages here. Look for the different heights of the trees where the trees on the left are younger than the trees on the right. That is a stream buffer in the middle. Those trees will never be removed. The soil and the climate in the Clackamas Basin is incredible for growing trees. Not all forests are the same and not all middle-aged forests are the same. They all have unique composition based on the local climate, soils, light, temperature, and moisture. The majority of the managed forest landscape is in some version of middle age. While the majority of middle-aged forests is closed canopy, there are usually patches where trees have died, which creates openings in the canopy. These openings allow sunlight to reach the forest floor. This was actually the focus of my thesis research, which I'm 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about in just a minute. A wide variety of wildlife live in middle-aged forests. Again, I've only identified a few of them here. Most of these species are found in multiple types of forest habitat. Many of them are generalists. However, several federal species of concern also live in these forests, including several species of amphibian. So for my master's degree research, I looked at the biodiversity of middle-aged forests and evaluated four taxa to see if there was a difference in their composition and abundance when evaluating two forest habitats. What you see here in the photo is a planted conifer forest that has some hardwood patches. The hardwood patches are those light brown areas. It's winter and all the leaves were had fallen off. Douglas fir trees are planted closely in a managed forest. And as they grow, they stretch out, limiting sunlight to the forest floor. But they don't grow well in places where the soil is too wet or where certain funguses thrive. These areas are often dominated by other plant species, often hardwood species. Where the hardwood species occur, sunlight is able to infiltrate through the canopy. The sunlight provides energy to the forest floor and subcanopy, allowing for photosynthesis. Many plant species are adapted to thrive in the forest understory when the right conditions exist. For this study, these were the two questions that I wanted to explore. Much research has been conducted that describes the importance of both conifer and hardwood habitats, including the study of gap dynamics, which looks at the function of habitat patches that are surrounded by a matrix of a different habitat type. This work builds on that work by looking specifically at the function of small hardwood patches that exist within the conifer matrix in managed forests. For the focal species, I chose to evaluate ground beetles, amphibians, reptiles, and birds because they are recognized as reasonable indicators of environmental conditions. Also, they each utilize different resources in the forest from the forest floor to the canopy. Assessing them in combination with, with each other significantly, significantly increase the strength of the study. These are photos from some of the plots. You can see a conifer plot on the left and a hardwood plot on the right. You can see the difference in the level of light in the composition of the vegetation community. The center photo shows some canopy gaps. The top, cat, the top photo is conifer dominated and the bottom photo is hardwood dominated. The gaps in the middle are shrub dominated forests. Here are the results of the taxa surveys in table format. Some of the beetle and bird species were observed but not included for the analysis. But in total, 388 individuals were detected encompassing 44 species. Of the animal species, 32 were associated with conifer plots and 40 were associated with hardwood, hardwood plots. All in all, 32% of species were unique to one habitat type or the other. When plants were included, 14 animal species and 23 plant species were associated with either conifer or hardwood dominated plots. Of the four taxa, significantly more pedifauna diversity occurred in hardwood dominated habitats rather than conifer dominated habitats. In plant species diversity and forest floor cover was also significantly higher in hardwood dominated habitats. These results indicate that small upland hardwood patches within the managed conifer matrix were very high functioning with the utilization of both habitat types by all taxa. So moving on to older forests, as the forest matures, this is a lot of content. I do apologize, but I hope that um, you're as excited about it as I am. And I hope you have good questions or interesting for me at the end. But as the forest matures, if another stand replacing disturbance doesn't occur, the forest will eventually develop the marks of older age, which equates into a lot of character and diversity. These forests take a long time to grow and develop. When they are greater than 200 years, they're considered late seral. They have a special role in the landscape. Dominant trees are bigger, but they're fewer per acre. They've been through a lot at this point. Some forests are hundreds of years old. You can see the marks of that. Some have evidence of fires that occurred long before us. These forests have a little of everything where small disturbances have occurred, such as wind and ice storms. There'll be pockets of emergent forest in these areas. 
On managed forest lands, these older forests are increasing over time as protected areas grow in acreage and in years. On Port Blakely's land, thousands of acres like this have been set aside to protect older forests, recognizing their importance on the landscape. Here are some photos of habitat features we would expect to find in an older forest. Everything is bigger here, bigger trees, bigger snags, bigger pieces of down wood. There's often vegetation growing on the down wood, multiple layers in the forest. The understory is very diverse. And they have a lot of different features growing on them themselves. You can see some of the larger limbs and platforms on the trees but you also have more gaps in the canopy, making way for new growth in the forest floor. So there are patches of young trees and shrubs throughout. These forests are usually very diverse. A wide variety of species live in older forests, including a few specialists, specifically the Northern Spotted Owl. We used to think protection of these habitats was the most important thing we could do to preserve these spe the species. But after decades of research, we've learned that population declines are much more complex and habitat protection is just one piece of the puzzle. These habitats don't function in isolation and they are not in static environments. They are dynamic and ever-changing with shifting vegetation and wildlife communities. They are connected to the plants, animals, and disturbances that are around it and that are perpetuated across the landscape. The Northern Spotted Owl we've learned is being heavily impacted by the expansion of the barred owl. The issue of how to protect threatened endangered species is complex and requires a collaborative landscape approach. We can't talk about forest habitats without acknowledging the vast stream systems that flow through them. A diverse array of aquatic habitats exist in the Clackamas River Basin. Here we see a wetland, a headwater stream, and a forested seep. All of these habitats function in association with the forested habitats that surround them. Riparian forests are those forests that grow next to streams and water bodies. Fresh water is critical to all life. These are biological hotspots for both vegetation and wildlife communities. Water and the forests and wildlife that surround them do not start and stop at property lines. Water flows beyond ownership and political boundaries connecting habitats at the landscape level. This video shows some different views from inside riparian forests. The ones you see here are headwater streams. Some have fish and some don't. Some flow year round and some go dry in the summer. These are the streams at the tippy top of the watershed. You can see the diversity of the understory vegetation. You can imagine the coolness provided by the shade of the canopy. These riparian forests provide biological corridors and connectivity and function as hotspots for native wildlife. They also function to protect water quality throughout the watershed. So next I wanna share about a couple specific species, a bat, a salamander, and a slug. These species utilize specific habitats and features in the Clackamas Basin. The long-legged myotis bats are found in forested areas. They're often associated with older conifer forests or other forested habitats with lots of habitat structure. They require large snags and hollow trees for day-night maternity roosts. They may also use bridges and forested habitat for night roosting and caves and mines for roosting and hibernating. They typically forage along riparian corridors and forest edges. This species is vulnerable because it needs to have places to roost and hibernate. Things we can do to help the species include maintaining and creating large diameter hollow trees and large diameter tall, newly dead snags in riparian and upland habitat. The Oregon slender salamander are only found on the western slopes of the Oregon Cascades. This species is endemic to this area of the world. I'll show you a map on the next slide. Understanding how natural and anthropogenic disturbance affects sensitive species is critical to supporting conservation. A large portion of the Oregon slender salamander distribution occurs in managed forests. 
Collaborative research has been conducted to examine the relationship with habitat conditions, specifically those found in managed forests. What we found so far is there is a strong relationship between the salamander and the amount of downed wood, where their occupancy and abundance increased with the number of downed wood structures. Here's where it exists. It's the only place in the whole world. This is a jumping slug, the Malone jumping slug. These are land-dwelling gastropods. Unlike snails, which hide their internal organs inside their shells and other slugs, which keep them in a cavity in their foot, jumping slugs have a soft hump on their back where they carry their organs. Slugs pay, play a very important role in ecosystems as recyclers of organic matter, consuming mostly decomposing and living foliage. One of the most interesting characteristics of this slug is its defense mechanism. And I'm gonna show you a video of it. This slug is um, endemic to Washington, Oregon, which is why I wanted to share it with you. Okay, this is its escape behavior. This is how it gets its name. When a jumping slug encounters a predator, such as a snail, beetle, or salamander, it coils up and straightens out quickly, flopping around, enabling itself to fall off wherever it was sitting. Not only does this hide the slug from view, it also breaks its slime trail, making it impossible for predators to tell where it went. The hump has a small partially exposed shell on it that has no known person, no known purpose. So there you go. Jumping slug can't jump, but it can break its suction. Now I'm going to shift in some wildlife conservation. Wildlife conservation can be achieved through many avenues. A holistic understanding requires coordinated effort and analysis at many levels. Comprehensive planning and collaboration will lead to the most effective results. The elements that affect the health of the species and their habitats is often very complex and multidimensional. Recovery efforts can be effective, however. For example, the bald eagle was brought back from the brink of extinction when the federal government banned the use of DDT in 1972 enlisted the eagle under the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1978. Recovery took decades and involved agencies, organizations, politicians, landowners, and the public. It was removed from the ESA in Oregon in 2007, and it was removed from the Oregon State Threatened List in 2012. Despite their comeback across the range, bald eagles are still a federally protected species but they are an absolute success story. I also want to mention that conservation of wildlife is not only about recover of, recovery of declining species. I think equally important, it is about keeping common species common. And that is about maintaining our ecosystem health as best we can. I'll provide some more examples of conservation efforts from Oregon and Washington over the next few slides. I want to start with monitoring because having good data is critical when making management plans to conserve species. Long-term population monitoring is important for assessing trends, understanding what we're dealing with. There are a lot of considerations to this work as wildlife populations move around and are influenced in ways we do not always understand. The Oregon spotted frog is endangered in Washington and threatened in Oregon. The species is not known to occur in the Clackamas Basin, but it is a good example for this type of data. In this example, egg mass monitoring occurs every year at a wetland where organ spotted frogs breed. Each, each egg mass that is encountered represents two adults. This is a graph of the number of egg masses that have been detected over time. This kind of data helps us assess activities and conditions that might be influencing the populations and helps us adjust our management and recovery plans accordingly. Conservation is often complex where multiple factors are contributing, like species movement, climate, predator-prey relations, and invasive species, just to name a few. This is, on this slide is an example of a fabulous partnership we had with the Clackamas River Basin Council. This partnership began in 2017 through the Shade Our Streams tree planting project. 
The project aims to improve water quality and lower stream temperature in the Clackamas River Basin. 3.2 miles of riparian area along Little Clear Creek on Park Lake Lou lands was overgrown with reed canary grass. That's the picture you can see on the left. Little Clear Creek is home to coho salmon amongst many other special aquatic organisms. Removal of invasive species in 2018 was followed by the replanting of thousands of plants, including at least 30 native tree and shrub species. In just four years, the effort has successfully restored riparian diversity and ecosystem function, as seen in the photo on the right. The Shader Stream program is working with many other landowners to achieve similar results. We are extremely grateful to have partners like the Clackamas River Basin Council to do projects like this. This slide is an example from Washington about the Pacific Fisher. The Pacific Fisher is listed as endangered in Washington and sensitive in Oregon. The species is not known to occur, occur in the Clackamas Basin at this time. In Washington, the populations were declined to extinction and many factors were involved, including over travel, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. In this case, there are healthy populations in Canada and plenty of suitable habitat across, across parts of their historic range in Washington. Reintroductions have been successful in establishing fisher populations throughout much of their southern portion of North America. And because of their success, fisher reintroductions into the Olympic Peninsula and Cascade Range were a prominent component of the fishery recovery plan for Washington. So we brought these fellows down from Canada and re released them in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington and the Cascades of Washington. They've been implemented in Washington because there appears to be sufficient habitat to support their populations. No. Surveys from 2016 have indicated that the reintroduced fishers have been reproducing and are widely distributed across the areas that they were reintroduced. And we've even caught some on game cameras showing fishers with kits. So we know that they're reproducing, which is really, really exciting. There have been discussions about reintroducing Fisher into the Oregon Cascades, more in the central part of the state. Fisher are in Southern Oregon currently, not very big populations. So they're talking about, there's discussions with the US Fish and Wildlife Service about just um, bringing Fisher out of Canada again and back down to central Oregon. In this example, I wanna talk about collaborative, collaborative research. Collaborative research can be extremely beneficial because natural resource challenges are often not confined by political boundaries. There are so many benefits to conducting research with partners. When you take a more holistic landscape approach, more expertise can be incorporated. You can do a much farther looking assessment that encompasses more of the diversity of conditions versus what would be found on a smaller portion of the landscape. You can capture more perspectives, ideas, concerns, resulting in much better problem solving and solution making with more resources to put towards the research and more diversity of thinking. In this example, the project was a collaborative effort with multiple partner, partners across both Oregon and Washington. No bears were injured during this study, but we did put research collars on bears because we wanted to understand how they moved across the landscape. In spring, when natural food sources are less available, bears sometimes peel the base of young to middle-aged trees causing damage or mortality. That's a picture of one on the left. Economic damage from bear peeling is estimated to be in the millions annually. And we wanted to know if peeling differed based on gender, age, and or time spent in a stand, how long bears spent in certain areas and how big their territories are and how they use their habitats in their territories. We had a lot of questions associated with this research. So we wanted to examine bear space use and habitat selection and attempt to develop a risk model to predict when and where and how much bear peel might occur in different areas. 
For this project, we put research collars on 49 bears across Oregon and Washington that covered both Cascade and coastal forests. And the analysis of this work is still underway. But we learned a ton about how they move across the landscape, where they spend time, and, and what they're doing in those areas. We went back in afterwards after they had moved through and did the habitat surveys in those areas just to see what, what it looked like. Um, and it was just, we learned so much about bears during this project. It was incredible. It wouldn't have been possible without all the partners. So as part of that project, we set up trail, trail cameras in the areas of the colored bears. And several were captured on camera. And a few of those even were identified with cubs, which was really exciting. Reproduction was a variable that we didn't think we'd be able to um, learn more about, but we were able to learn more about it because we had data to show they were there and then we could see sign of them in some of the forests. So I want to end with a few things that landowners and managers can do to ensure habitats remain diverse. Um, hopefully one thing you've captured from this presentation is that habitat diversity is very important for wildlife diversity and resiliency. Habitat diversity can be managed for landscape and local scales to create a habitat level mosaic that occurs at the landscape. The goal is to maintain or enhance the diversity of aquatic and terrestrial habitats that exist throughout our forests. Um, there are prescriptions that can be applied to any age of forests, uh, young, middle, or older, to increase the types of habitat features that we've talked about today. We've learned a lot that dead wood standing and on the ground is absolutely critical in our forests, and we have to keep it. We know that more than 100 species utilize it and that if we're not careful, we could use, lose those types of features because it's not uncommon for humans to want to remove the dead wood. So um, now we're trying to intentionally add it back in all the places that we can because we recognize how critical it is for our species. So it's extremely important to start with what you know about a site. If you have a site that you want to manage for habitat, habitat diversity, and you start by conducting surveys or walking through your property to identify everything you possibly can about it, map out the resources, gain an understanding of the abundance and distribution of habitat features. This includes snags, down wood, where are the streams and wetlands, are there special sites like meadows or cliffs? Map all this out. Once you know what you have, you can design a plan to protect and or restore the high functioning habitats that are capable of providing the habitat requirements for native aquatic and terrestrial species. I'll provide a few examples of things that you can do to enhance it. In areas where habitats have been simplified or just if you want to create habitat to attract certain species, there are features that can be created or enhanced that are known to be beneficial. As we learned earlier, dead standing trees are an important element in forests. Trees can be girdled, cored, or top to encourage it to develop into a snag faster than it otherwise would. The benefit of girdling or coring trees is that it doesn't kill the tree instantly and allows it to continue to grow and die more slowly, creating a larger size snag. Different sizes and species of snags with various levels of decay are all attractive to different wildlife species, hardwoods and conifer alike. Wood pieces, wood pieces can also be piled up like in that uh, photo in the lower right. These create habitat features that can be used by small mammals for denning or resting. We've also seen birds and bats use piles like this. One of the challenges we've seen is in um, forests that are were at agriculture at one point that have been converted back to forest have hardly any legacy woody features. And so we've been trying to build piles like this in some of those areas to try to bring back some of that habitat diversity. We know it's not the same thing, but it's a proxy that we're trying to add more structure back out there in some of these habitats that have been simplified over time based on past management practices. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out which trees you want to leave and which trees you might want to take out, there is definitely a difference and a signature for high wildlife value trees. Look for large limbs, cavities, broken tops, or signs of fungus. These are likely already being used by wildlife in some form or fashion and will continue to function for years, if not decades to come, if the right conditions persist. 
and um, wildlife are definitely choosy about some of the places they want to live. And these are these trees that are already showing signs of decay and wildlife use are definitely hot spots for wildlife. So um, I'm just about here to the end. This is my last slide. And I wanted to just leave you that are helpful if you're interested in learning more about species of concern in Oregon and ways you can get involved for conservation. Um, there are just a ton of amazing people that are working hard to uh, do good things in Oregon. And I've had the privilege of working with a lot of them. And it's just um, a wonderful place to be working on wildlife issues and trying to do better things for the future of wildlife. So um, I'll leave this slide up and we can open it up for questions if there are any. Well, Claudine, as usual, excellent job. You didn't, you didn't cut out uh, you know, at all really. So thank you very much. So yeah, as Claudine mentioned, we've got a Q&A now. So Gail will uh, consolidate the questions and ask Claudine what you folks are asking and certainly fo ask follow-up questions that, if, if the questions that she's asking elicit others. So why don't you go ahead, Gail, and shoot, shoot away. All right, Claudine, wonderful presentation, beautiful slides, and I love the videos. Um, the first question is, of the forested 47% of Oregon, do you know about how much is managed forest? Um. I feel like I want to flip back to that slide to see what that is. See if there was a figure for that. I do not know that number off the top of my head. Okay. Well, before uh, we get going, Glenn, uh, do you have anything you can add to that? Maybe not. If he doesn't, you know, I can just roughly say that uh, you know, of, of the forests in Oregon, about 40% are privately owned and about 60% are federally owned and both of them have varying degrees of management associated with them. So uh, that, that's really a tough, that's a good, very good question, but it's a tough question. I think it would take some digging on, on our part to figure out the answer to it. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I guess it depends on the kind of management because um, a large portion of it is managed, but then they're managed with different objectives. So, you know, the national forests are, are managed, even though a lot of it are, is in reserves and not a whole lot of, you know, human intervention, so to speak, but there's still, you know, some kind of a management plan and approach that goes on there. Um, so, yeah, you have to drill into the, you know, what kind of management. Um, one of these uh, graphs, I think, that the, uh, it's called the um, Oregon Program for Oregon Forests, uh, you know, Department of Forestry tried to categorize it, intensive management for wood products, multi-use management, and more reserve or wilderness management. And it was almost equal, like one third, one third, one third of the forest. So about a third was intensive management for wood products. Another third was sort of multi-use across a variety of owners. And then, then another third was more reserves or preservation oriented management what I recall. All right, I'm gonna keep asking because we do have quite a few questions here. Uh, Glenn asked on the bear study, what were the yellow lines and blue markers? Can you see this when I scroll back through the presentation? We can see it now on my screen, there's kind of a gray uh, rectangle right in the middle of the screen that I don't I can't see what's behind that. It wasn't there when you did your slideshow before, but there we go. Disappeared. Now okay. I can see everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the yellow line is the track where the bear moved and the blue bubbles are the amount of time that a bear spent in a specific location. So the higher the number, the longer the time spent in those areas. So that is where we believe resting and foraging occurred and the yellow line is traveling. Thank you for the question and the clarification. Good question. Yeah, also, the big river. And then also on that study, where was that location? Where, where was the study located? 
The study was located across all of Western Oregon and all of Western Washington. Wow. So from coastal to Cascade foothills and from the Olympic Peninsula down to Southern Oregon. Oh, that's quite extensive. Yes, lots of partners. Okay. Uh, Laura asks, this is a kind of a general question, but uh, are there any damaging invasive species in the forests of the Clackamas? So this is an excellent question. I bet there's a lot of other expertise on this call for it. I actually did have a slide that I was gonna build just on invasive species because it's such an important topic when we're talking about wildlife conservation. Um, there are many species in Oregon. I don't know of that huge list exactly which of all of those are in the Clackamas Basin. I know that I have seen an enormous amount of English ivy specifically associated with older homesteads that were really common across the region um, about a hundred years ago and Himalayan blackberry that's also growing in huge patches in these old homesteads and in our riparian areas. So um, we also have a prevalence of scotch broom, thistles and um, a weed called senecio. So there is definitely a prevalence of invasive species that are being managed that I know of, but I suspect there's a whole lot more that I'm also not aware of that others might be able to chime in on. Yeah, the staff of CRBC spends a lot of effort uh, trying to eradicate or at least control a lot of different invasive species in riparian areas for sure. So um, back to the bear study, the image that's shown right now on your screen, where is that location? This is in um, east of Morton, at, that's the head of Rife Lake in Washington. And that's okay. Port Blakely's land is why I felt comfortable showing this image. Makes sense. All right, and Cheryl put in the chat, Japanese knotweed is a big species that we do spend a lot of time in. Although at this point, it's almost gotten to be ubiquitous within the Clackamas Basin. I see it a lot, unfortunately. Um, okay, Glenn also asked, does the Port Blakely approach to habitat management incorporate landscape scale features adjacent to habitat on other ownerships? Wait, can you repeat that? I apologize. Um, yeah, we, we can ask Glenn if we need to clarify too. He says, does the Port Blakely approach to habitat management incorporate landscape scale features? Um, so I think he means on adjacent habitat that might be owned by others as well. So we definitely try to develop habitat plans that are complementary to what is around us um, and try to figure out ways to, at a minimum, connect habitats that might be around us. So Port Blakely's ownership, I didn't show a map of it, but it's kind of spread out. We don't really have large blocks of contiguous habitat. So we are part of a broader landscape. We don't own landscapes. And that's where our partnerships become so, so, so level. What we can do is make sure that we're not harvesting large portions of certain of certain of what we own of certain landscapes so that that we're creating that patchwork habitat dynamic that at a minimum provides a diversity of habitat that we can provide on a managed forest. Um, we do want to be complementary to adjacent forests where, say, um, down in our Oregon properties, we have northern spotted owls that are adjacent to us, and we want our habitat to be conducive to supporting the recovery of the spotted owl, even if the spotted owl isn't on us. We want to have the habitat features that would be a healthy place for owls to forage, a healthy place for owls to disperse, um, a safe place but we're likely not gonna have the nesting habitat. That would be something that's found on adjacent forests. We're just complementing them with these other things we can produce with these different types of forest habitat. All right, very good. Uh, Liz asks, what are the habitat preferences for the Oregon slender salamander? I can't believe I didn't say that. That was the whole point of that slide. Um, thank you so much for asking this, Liz. Um, 
coarse woody debris, large decaying woody debris on the forest floor is critical to the organ slender salamander. It was found to be the most important habitat feature when all the other habitat features were also looked at and considered during the research. So even in different ages of forests where the salamander was investigated, the common denominator was large decaying woody debris on the forest floor. That is where they live, that is where they are associated, and that was the most important habitat feature that we have to keep in the forest in order to keep that species happy. Wonderful, glad we got that, that asked. Um, a little bit related to the question you just answered about landscape scale and adjacent habitats, Maddie asks, is Oregon and Port Blake, is Oregon and Port Blakely building any wildlife corridors to connect habitats? Oh my gosh, I do love this question. So we're part of a habitat connectivity work group in both Oregon and Washington. And what we're looking at is we're actually modeling habitat of, of what we're considering keystone species, species that are migratory and very common in the Oregon landscape. How, how do they naturally be moving across the landscape? And we're utilizing that data. Now we're in the testing phase of the model. And what we're doing is we're putting up trail cameras across all the places that the model told us were most critical for wildlife movement so that we can learn if those indeed if the model got it right and then the next step will be to to work with partners to create landscape level connectivity in these areas that have been prioritized based on all of this work so it's a really important question and it's important now more than ever because there are no there are no more slow moments on our roads so in places where wildlife used to be able to move around a little more safely, that's less and less the case. So um, excellent question. A lot of people looking at this and um, hopefully we'll have some good solutions in the future. Okay, that sounds great. I know in uh, the Portland metro area, also metro is working on some habitat corridor maps, um, which could be helpful. All right, Grant would like to know, how are the deer and elk populations faring with older and current managed forests? So I definitely would not consider myself an expert in this area. From what I've, I definitely encounter deer and elk in the forest, deer much more than elk. I'm not aware of any problems. I think um, the, the scenario with apex predators is probably part of what whatever we're seeing as well as the availability of forage habitat. So um, is there anybody else on the call that has more color on how the deer and elk populations might be doing in the basin? I can follow up and find out some information and get back if that would be beneficial, but I, I can't say that I absolutely know the full spectrum of details for that. All right, I'm sure that's fine. Um, and then we just have a comment as our last uh, item. Catherine would like to thank Port Blakely for allowing non-motorized recreational use in their managed forests. Um, and I know she's not the only one who enjoys that benefit. She says, I've been watching the restoration along Little Clear Creek for several years and enjoy riding my bicycle along those roads. I'm so glad. Please do continue to make do there. We love having stewards in the forest. I mean, we consider us all to be partners and in this together. So thank you. Okay. And we did get one more question, actually, uh, from Nancy. Are there portions or types of forests used by flora and fauna for different functions, such as nurseries, mating, et cetera? Do animals move between the areas for specific purposes? And are there studies detailing that? Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go back to the forex succession illustration because that's what this is showing. If you can see the black, the graph at the bottom with the black and the red columns, um, what that's representing is the number of breeding species and the number of feeding species that are in these different types of habitat. And this is, um, this doesn't tell you what those species are, but when you look behind the data, it's, it's different. So these species are all utilizing these habitats in different ways and they're going back and forth between them based on what their 
are that based on what they're doing as part of their life cycle, breeding or feeding. And then we know that there is also migration and, and territories that are within these. So um, this is based on a report from 1985, a book actually. And there is a ton of science that supports and, and goes into detail on the different species utilizing these different habitats for different portions of their life. So it's a really important principle to understand because all of our forests and habitats are inter interconnected. They are not operating in, in isolation of what's going on around them. So, um, and, and then within that, they each have individual niches. So what do they bring to these habitats? What are they doing to support the integrity of the ecosystem and the function of those habitats? So I would be happy to provide much more information on the details of that. There is a, a lot of science to um, go into the detail and, and we still have a lot more to learn, of course, as well. Great question. Yeah, so much complexity that things are so intertwined. Hey, Gail, right. is that, does that pretty much wrap up the question, text chat questions? Those are all the questions in the chat, unless anybody wanted to unmute and ask their question. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it back over to David. Okay. Good. Well, we just have a few last announcements before we sign up. First off, thank you again, Claudine, for a marvelous presentation. Very clear and organized, and uh, I, I learned a lot. Our next session will be on August 24th, our fourth forestry class in our forestry science series with forest scientists Matthew Riley and Becky Flitcroft. They'll discuss wildfires in the Clackamas River Basin, so this is something you're going to want to pass on to your friends and neighbors, especially if you live out in the woodlands like us, uh, to make sure that you uh, get some information there. You can use the same Zoom meeting link and are already registered for the event, and we'll send a reminder, like probably most of you received uh, today, an email, uh, you know, a day or, or so, or even the same day as the uh, event. Then we'll send you uh, a thank you email with the link, as well as the link to the recording. Again, thank you, Claudine, for tonight's wonderful talk. And we also wanna thank our gold sponsors, the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative and the Clackamas Water Environment Services, and our brown sponsors, the Clackamas River Water Providers, Metro, and the Geological Society of the Oregon Country, who have been keeping this conference free for our participants. So again, please consider donating if you're interested. And thank you for joining us tonight, and please let us know what you thought of tonight's program, and we'll see you two Tuesdays from now on August 24th. Thank you again. Thanks, Claudine. And Gail. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was wonderful. Really great. Great information, Claudine. Thank you. Thank you. I just thought I'd mention since uh, if there's folks still on that there were and Maddie's question about wildlife corridors was an excellent one. And on the formalized corridors, that is corridors over transportation corridors, such as highways and whatnot, the Oregon Wildlife uh, Foundation is putting together a customized license plate. And the proceeds from that license plate go to funding wildlife corridors over areas where they may be injured, you know, transport our transportation corridors. So if folks are interested in learning more about that, just Google Oregon Wildlife Foundation and uh, check out their license plate and uh, sign up for a pre-order if you want one. And we also have opportunity to give Metro feedback on their park and nature bond uh, activities. Uh, to influence corridor development that they also have an interest in developing. Good, excellent. Thanks, Cheryl. And I appreciated all the, um, the invasives that Claudine made mention of, um, and those were the primary ones. We also have some emerging um, other invasives such as uh, policeman's helmet, garlic mustard, uh, I think she mentioned false brown scotch. Who, so who, who should uh, folks contact, you know, uh, if they're concerned about that and they want to learn more or if they think they may have an invasive, uh, would that be CRBC or Clackamas Soil and Water? Who should they contact? I think the, um, the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District has a weed wise program as well as they are coordinating our joint uh, Clackamas River Invasive Species Program. So for both those reasons, 
Clackamas uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. You may have CRBC helping you, uh, but uh, they would be a great first contact. 